Thank you so much for being with me again today. We finished 1 John last week, so today we're going to look at the epistle of 2 John, and then next week we will conclude this portion of the study on John's writings uh, by completing 3 John. Uh, again, I'm glad that you're with me today. Really, the book of 2 John, it has to do with the sad, sad subject of apostasy. It has to do with that subject of false teachers who were once active in the church but began uh, diluting the, the truth, diluting the Word of God and, and leading others in the church astray. And matter of fact, uh, they even reached a point that even though although they once belonged to the church and believed in the church, they had reached a point that now they spoke evil against the church or they tried to change the message of the church. So, uh, again, the question, uh, what are apostate teachers? It's teachers who take an element of the truth and uh, add a falsehood to it, add to uh, or in some way or another dilute the Word of God. And so how would such uh, teachers infiltrate the church? Well, I want to remind you that we as human beings, even after we become the children of God, uh, we still have to deal with our own pride from time to time. And if it weren't for the fact that we were trusting in uh, the Holy Spirit guiding us and leading us throughout our lives, we too could be prone to uh, allowing that pride to fill our hearts and, uh, and, and maybe uh, allowing Satan to lead us astray as a result of our, uh, uh, of our pride. So, let me ask you about today. Maybe we see how the apostate teachers infiltrated the churches back then in the days of the early church, but how do false teachers... How do apostate teachers, uh, people who once claimed faith in Christ, how do they invade the church today and lead people astray? Well, uh, I think that the most obvious for our day and time is the uh, cults that come knocking on your door. And, uh, and then, by the same token, you can find false teachings behind the scenes at an unsuspecting church. It can actually take place behind the scenes, behind the back of the pastor, behind the back of the leadership of the church. You can also see false teaching begin coming from the church who is willing to be absolutely everything to everybody, no matter what. So in other words, they try to be everything to please the people rather than being something to please God. Uh, we can also see uh, apostasy at work in our schools. Uh, I want to remind you today that whenever we stand up and, and we recite the Pledge of Allegiance, now, now I want you to think about this. You know what the Pledge of Allegiance means to you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the country through which it stands, one nation, what's the next words? One nation under God. Now, whenever that pledge was formed, that one nation under God, it simply meant Jehovah God. It meant God, the Father of Jesus Christ. And now when somebody pledges allegiance to a flag, they can make that one nation under God, they can make that God in their own minds be anything that they want it to be. And so we can see that even in our pledge of allegiance, if we're not careful, that apostasy is being taught. False, false doctrine is being taught today. So, so through our schools, into our homes, through our TV sets, Right now, right now, apostasy, false teaching, false religion, right now is being taught through politics. Or what about through crude jokes at work, 
that over a period of time, those crude jokes become accepted behavior or through everyday conversations. So, so you see, we can allow certain things to begin to happen in our lives, and over time, those things become accepted behavior instead of questionable behavior as before. So uh, it's quite easy today for false teaching and apostasy to enter in to the local church and especially enter into the homes of Christian people. I want to remind you that apostasy always contains an element of the truth. So it always contains an element of the truth with a falsehood added to it. You know, it would be difficult for us to accept the falsehood were it not for the element of truth that's attached to it. And, and so, uh, so that is the method that Satan uses to try to lure unsuspecting Christians away from the truth of God's Word. Now, the bottom line is, uh, if we do not really know the truth of God's Word, uh, we are already targets. We have made ourselves to be targets of apostasy and false, false teaching. Now, uh, you can imagine how easy it would have been for apostasy to creep into the early church. So easy. Now, one of the reasons it was easy back then is no one church had a complete set of the scriptures. Not a one. Matter of fact, in the early church, uh, it, it, uh, the uh, Gospels were not written until about 30 years after Jesus Christ had uh, risen from the dead and had ascended back into heaven. And, and, and so they did not have a complete set of, of, of scriptures. And so the only thing that they had was uh, portions of the Old Testament scriptures and the lessons that were taught to them by the apostles. And I'm sure that that's why it was so important. I'm sure that at every single meeting, they would be writing things down because they didn't have things uh, in a bound form as, as we do today. I want to remind you that also a cultist, somebody from a false religion, a cult, somebody that, uh, and, and a cult is a uh, false religion that springs from what had once been a, uh, a traditionally accepted Christian church. So, uh, so again, these false teachers, these cult teachers take an element of the truth and they mix it with a false doctrine. Uh, this letter, it begins, uh, uh, John describes himself as an elder. He says, this is from the elder, meaning himself. And uh, he begins by saying that this letter is delivered to a lady that's chosen by God. Now, my question to you is this. Was this a real lady, or was it a reference to a local church congregation? So I want you to think about that for a moment. Some Bible scholars believe that the letter was written to a specific lady, and uh, maybe the church met at her house. Maybe she was the hostess for the people who met at the church. Maybe the church met at her house and her children were leaders of the church. So if that were the case, uh, whenever you read the first few uh, verses in 2 John, her children may refer to her own children or perhaps the spiritual children that attended worship at her house weekly. But I want you to notice one thing, though. The lady is unnamed. And for me, that gives credence that whenever John is referring to the lady, I believe he's talking about a church, not a specific lady. And, and so I think it's more realistic to believe that the lady is referencing, that term is referencing a church, and that her children are the members who attend that church. 
Now, there's three important lessons that we're going to try to uh, uh, look at today and, and research. The uh, first thing we're going to talk about today is found in the first three verses of 2 John. And uh, that first thought is we must know the truth. We must know the truth. We must know God's Word. The second thing is, we must walk in the truth. And then the third thing we're going to talk about today, and it covers the last few verses of this short letter, is that we must not only know the truth and walk in the truth, but we must abide in the truth. So what we want to do, first of all, is just look at the first three verses together. And uh, these verses talk about the importance of us knowing the truth. It says, the elder, meaning John, the elder to the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in the truth. And not I only, but also all who know the truth. Because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. Now notice that. In these three short verses, the word truth is used four different times. And, and so he's making it clear that this truth that he is talking about, it is clearly our reality. This truth is reality. And, uh, and many times in John's own writings, in the Gospel of John and in his three epistles and even in the book of Revelation, remember, John wrote five of our 27 New Testament books. And, and so, let me just give you a few for instances about how much John valued the truth. Uh, he said, uh, through the words of Jesus in John 14, 6, he acknowledged that Jesus Christ was the truth. Do you remember Jesus himself was speaking? And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father except through me. And then in John 17, 17, John records that God's word is truth. So now notice this. Jesus Christ is the truth, and God's word is the truth. I want to take you back uh, uh, to the Gospel of John, the very beginning. Uh, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So notice this. Jesus Christ is the truth. God's word is the truth, and God's word was God. And then in John 14, verses 16 and 17, and then again in John 16, verse uh, uh, 13, we are taught that God has given us the spirit of truth. He's given us the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of truth, and the Holy Spirit will teach us and enable us to know the truth. The Holy Spirit will teach us and enable us to know our reality. So notice that. John was addressing the truth, and, and he was doing so in this fashion in 2 John because there were false teachers around. They were taking John's words and mixing them up. They were taking John's words and spreading error, and this was confusing the people. And John called them, in verse 7, deceivers and antichrist. Now, um, we're going to look at that word, antichrist, a little bit differently in just a few moments. And, and I want to share with you that whenever he uses the word antichrist in this passage of Scripture, He's, talk, he's talking about false teachers who have been alive in every generation. He's not talking about that one world leader, that one antichrist that is being described in the uh, last generation of time. He is talking about anyone through any given generation who has uh, stood against the message of Christ through the Bible and they've added words of their own to try to redefine who Jesus is. 
and and, and so uh, so they are referred to as Antichrist. And so uh, I, I read a couple of quotes from Warren Wiersbe this week that I, I just want to share with you before we move on because they spoke to my heart. And the first one is this. Warren Wiersbe says, Since truth will be with us forever, we certainly had ought to get acquainted with it and learn to love it. So since truth will be with us forever, we ought to get acquainted with it now and learn to love it. So we need to learn to love the truth because the truth isn't going anywhere. The truth is going to be here. And uh, in reference to these apostate teachers, uh, in reference to these individuals who were sharing uh, a false interpretation of God's word, uh, I, I, I want you to notice another quote that I read this week, and, and I'm not certain, I, I believe this one also came from Warren Wiersbe, but I'm not certain. Uh, uh, God is not at war with sinners. It is sinners who are at war with God. Now, I, I want you to notice that. God is not at war with sinners. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So right there we see God is not at war with sinners, but it is sinners who are at war with God. Those sinners who say, I don't need God, or I don't want God today, or those who know the Word of God and they say, you know what, this Word of God, this portion of it is not for me, so let's change the, th the thinking of the people. Let's make it say something it really doesn't say. Now, so if you're trying to twist the words of God and make them say uh, something you want them to say rather than something that God wants them to say to us, then aren't you acting against God, as an enemy of God, aren't you acting at war with God when you're trying to twist God's words only to satisfy and settle your own personal convenience? So we see in these first few verses how important the truth really, really is. And, uh, and, and it clearly says in verse number two that the truth will be with us forever. So, now, um, have you noticed that uh, if you were to ever talk to a cultist, I remember there have been a few times I've allowed them into my home uh, so that I could defend the scriptures. And, uh, and so, uh, so usually what a cultist will say, this is where they make their first line of attack against the truth. They will say, yes. Jesus is the Son of God, but he's only the Son of God in the same way that you and I are made in the image of God. So now think about that for a moment. But you and I know that we, even though we were created in the image of God, we tar tar tarnished that image through our sins, and we were incapable of saving ourselves. And so it took something greater than us to provide for our salvation. So I, I want you to realize that. Now, whenever Jesus claimed to be God's son, the cultists say he was not really claiming to be God. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus said, no one comes through the Father except through me. So I even want to uh, point out to you, uh, um, you know, uh, Jesus uh, makes it very clear as his divinity in, uh, in Paul's writings in uh, Philippians chapter 2, uh, one of my favorite chapters in the entire passage of Scripture. Since I've been uh, at Mount Zion, I have quoted uh, Philippians 2.5 a lot. Uh, let's let this mind or let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. But notice what it says in verse 6 of Philippians chapter 2. It says, Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something for him to use to his own advantage. 
So he saw himself as being God the Son. He saw himself as being equal to God. But because he was sent to earth uh, to, uh, to represent his Father, while he was here on earth, he took on humanity. And while he was in that humanity, he did not see his divine powers as something to take advantage of for his own purposes. So uh, he, he, uh, that is why whenever he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if there's any other way, you see, he was going to have to go to the cross and he was going to have to suffer in his humanity so that whenever he would rise again on that third day, his deity would be fully revealed. And, and so, um, uh, uh, again, Jesus Christ, is equal to God, and we need to see that. So, first of all, we must know the truth. Secondly, we must walk in the truth. And so, to walk in the truth, it not only means that we obey it, but we, could, we permit the truth to control every area of our lives. So, I want you to notice in verses 4 through 6, notice what God's Word says in this passage of Scripture. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, and again, I think he's writing to a church. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one that we've had from the very beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands as you have heard from the beginning, and his command is that you walk in love. Now, remember that whenever we were back in uh, the letter of 1 John, over and over and over again, uh, we find out that that new commandment to love, and, uh, and we find there in chapter 3 and in chapter 4, uh, uh, John uh, just seems to bring home that same uh, 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 point and he repeats himself over and over and over and over again. And he makes it very clear that if we say we love God, but yet we hate our brother, that, that we really don't love God at all. Because how can we uh, uh, hate our brother whom we have seen and still love God who we have not seen? We've not seen God uh, in the flesh. Only a portion of God's glory has been seen. My mind goes back to uh, whenever uh, Moses was on the mountain with God, and Moses said to God, Lord, show me your glory. And one of the things that uh, uh, God said to him, he said, no one has ever looked on me and lived. And, and that passage of scripture has been uh, greatly confused. Uh, really, what God was saying is, the full measure of my glory is only for you to experience once you come into my kingdom in heaven. So that's what God was te teaching him. He was saying, you know what, if you saw the full measure of my glory, you know, it, it's reserved for those who make their home with me in heaven. And, uh, and it's not time for you to experience that full measure of my glory. But I'm going to walk, I'm going to let you walk behind me and see me from the back to see just a portion of my glory. And you see, it was just that portion of God's glory that enabled Moses to go back and, and, and to deliver with excitement what God's plan was. It enabled Moses to walk in the truth. And today, through the person of the Holy Spirit that resides in us whenever we become a Christian, we have been given a portion of God's glory, just a portion that will enable us not only uh, to know the truth, but also to begin walking in the truth. So, so that's one of the things that, that we need to remember today. Now, I want to ask you a question. Uh, this question comes from these writings of John, but uh, he, he, he says this commandment is not a new one. He said, I've been telling you this over and over and over again. So is it possible to command love? Is it possible to command love. You know, we get caught up thinking that love is nothing more than an emotion. And we get caught up on this idea that, that maybe our emotion will be drawn to a certain individual 
And so because our emotions are drawn to that individual, it is easy to love them. But, uh, but I, I, I realize that there are certain emotions that do draw us. There were certain emotions that attracted me uh, uh, to Kathy, and as a result of those emotions attracting me to my wife, uh, it helped me, it made that decision to love her so much easier. Uh, and, and so I realized that part of it. And I also realized that now that I've had children and my children have had children, there is just this natural emotion that causes me to seemingly automatically love my grandchildren. But the bottom line in all that is, it all began with a decision to love. And, and there are some people that uh, maybe because they're not like you, maybe they're not even tempered like you are, or maybe they appear to be more selfish than you are. And, and there are just some people that, that are not as easy to love. And, and so John was hammering home the point, you people have to decide that, that you're going to decide to love just like Jesus decided to love you whenever he decided to go to the cross on your behalf. Even though he had never seen you, even though you had not been born yet, uh, Jesus decided to love the unlovable. It took a healthy decision to be able to do that. And you and I need to be making some healthy decisions. I'm going to decide to love because that's God's command. And following God's command is always a healthy thing to do. And then finally, verses 7 through 11. I believe verses 12 and 13 speak for themselves. Uh, matter of fact, I'll just mention them to you in passing. Paul wanted to let them know. He said, I've got a lot to write to you about. He said, but I don't want to use my paper and ink. Instead, I'd rather come see you and talk with you face to face because just being able to be together in person, or John said this, it would make our joy complete. So, so John was saying this, not Paul. And then he, uh, he says, the children of your sister who is chosen by God send their greeting. So, but verses 7 through 11. Uh, we must learn how to abide in the truth. Notice what uh, John says. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for or what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. So we've got to be careful that if somebody is teaching something that is not the truth, uh, we certainly cannot stand with them. We certainly cannot say that we agree with them. You know, I, I uh, even there is a phrase that we often use that I think sometimes is dangerous. That phrase that says, well, you're entitled to your own opinion. You know, uh, just because somebody's entitled to an opinion, it doesn't mean that their opinion is truth. And uh, I think that there are times that we stand by the truth regardless. We stand by the truth regardless. Uh, I have a friend who used to say, it doesn't matter what you think. Then he would say, it doesn't matter what I think. It only matters what the Word of God says. Now, and, and so, uh, so I think that one of the things that uh, would help you, if you find somebody twisting the Word of God, uh, uh, just ask them, Look at it. Look at it for yourself. What does that really say there? In its context, what does the Word of God say? And so uh, uh, John was giving us some instructions that, uh, that we needed to be careful. We needed to be careful uh, uh, of going back. We don't need to go back and incorporate the thinking of, uh, uh, that we had prior to knowing Christ 
and try to blend that in with our knowledge of knowing Christ. We don't need to take the words that we've read and think that they're incomplete. If they were incomplete, uh, if, if they were uh, not complete, God would have seen fit to have added to them. How many times do we see people that uh, try to add to the Word of God because they think that uh, they're helping God out, that God didn't fully uh, uh, make himself clear? Um, he warns that people who do these sort of things are uh, deceivers and antichrists. Now, in John's writings, whenever you see the word Antichrist, uh, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean opposed to Christ. Uh, it can also mean instead of Christ. So that prefix anti, it can also mean instead of. Uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, the word counterfeit. Now, let me ask you a question about a counterfeit dollar bill. If you have a counterfeit 20, uh, is that worth $20? No, it's not even worth the paper that it was printed on. It's not even worth the paper that it was printed on. It's a counterfeit. It's not authentic. And, uh, and so you may try to substitute it for money, and you possibly, if you get caught, you'll get in trouble for that. But a counterfeit bill is not worth a thing. And a counterfeit savior, uh, uh, you know, counterfeit words, whenever we treat the word of God and apply something instead of or in place of to satisfy our own needs, to satisfy our own desires, to satisfy our own whims. You see, uh, some of these people were trying to do things instead of being completely faithful to Jesus Christ, instead of learning to abide in him. John, in his writing in the gospel, he quotes the words of Jesus uh, and uh, uh, in, in uh, John chapter 15. Jesus talks about the importance of us abiding in him, the importance of abiding in the vine and, and seeing the blessings that uh, uh, of uh, doing things the way Jesus would have us to do things. And again, I want to remind you once again, there is this danger of going beyond, this danger of going ahead. Um, in the uh, Old Testament, the story of, of uh, Jonah is filled with illustrations that fit, I believe, what John is talking about. Let me give you a for instance. Whenever God told Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach, uh, he tells him to get on a boat and go to Nineveh to preach. So Jonah does get on a boat, but he buys a ticket for Tarshish. He buys a ticket for the city that is in the most opposite direction of Nineveh. You see, John did not love the residents of Nineveh. Uh, they were considered an enemy to him. He was prejudiced toward them or against them, prejudiced against them. And uh, he wasn't opposed to preaching for God, but he wanted to go as far away from the Ninevites as he possibly could. And he even admitted later on that if he went to the Ninevites, they'll only repent. And that's exactly what they did do. They did repent. So now notice, uh, uh, Jonah was uh, uh, going back. He wanted to go back and preach for God, but he didn't want to do it in Nineveh. So he was choosing his own terms. And, and uh, whenever we look at God's commands, there are no terms but his terms. And so we need to remember that. And then also we find out that whenever Jonah did actually end up in Nineveh and preach, uh, the next thing that he did, now remember, we see him preaching a sermon of repentance in Jonah chapter 3, and you get to Jonah chapter 4, and where is Jonah? He is sitting out in a lawn chair underneath a bush, catching him some shade, and he's on top of the hill watching and waiting to see if God destroys the city or not. You know, uh, God, are you going to make my prophecy true? 
Well, there was a clause in that prophecy that God was going to destroy the city of Nineveh unless they repent. And from his lawn chair up above the hill of the city, what he saw was the king and the leaders of the city tearing their clothes and crying out to God, pleading for his forgiveness. And it made him mad because he wanted them to be destroyed. So now notice, he wanted his words to be his words, not God's words. He wanted his words uh, to be followed, not God's will to be followed. So there is a danger of going ahead. There's a danger of going beyond. And, and uh, John even writes to the point that if a person does not abide in the true doctrine, he does not have either the Father or the Son. And so, uh, so the way to honor God is to honor the Son. So, um, so here again, uh, as I close out today, let me ask you a couple of questions. Why was John so adamant about all of this? Why was he so adamant about these false teachers? Well, because he did not want any of God's children to give a false teacher the impression that his heretical doctrine was acceptable. Um, John did not want any of God's children to become infected themselves. And then number three, John did not want any of God's children to give the false teacher any false uh, or any ammunition that this teacher could use at a later date. Now, there have only been a very, very few times that I have let false teachers into my home. And it was at a time that maybe I had recently um, uh, studied some of their false doctrines so that I could use some of their prophecies and some of their doctrine uh, uh, against them. And in those times that I let people in, uh, uh, those moments, those were honored by God, and I found those to be very, very effective. And uh, then there were times I felt as if I was just beating my head against a wall, and, and, and uh, God doesn't want me to put myself in that sort of, 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 of a position. So really, uh, on all of the major cults, now, you know, I'm not talking about the other denominations. I'm talking about a lot of the cults that, that most of our denominations would deem as being false teachers. But uh, I tried to find um, uh, some of the holes that other leaders have found in years gone by. And if they come to my house to present their doctrine, I tell them they have to answer me a few questions first. And they've never been able to ask, uh, answer some of the questions, particularly uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, some of the false prophecies that they made about the early 1900s that never came past, never came to be. And so uh, I usually whenever I point all of those out, they are ready to leave and, and they don't have any desire to stay and talk with me. They're ready to go someplace else. But, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, it's not the cultists knocking on our doors that are the real problem today. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, the false teachers today that are invading our churches are doing so. They're invading our churches through the arena of politics, through the arena of television, and, and just through the arena of, uh, uh, of our homes. And, and so my prayer is that we would so know God's word so that we would be able to defend ourselves whenever false teachers present, our, uh, present themselves to us. Thank you so much for being a part of this Bible study today. God bless you.